Battleground Productions presents Brass, the audio serial, episode three, The Reception. The year is 1885, but not one that would be familiar to you. For this is a 19th century that differs in many ways from the one in our history books. While the reception gallery in the Palace of Westminster is as glorious as the one in our own history, the royalty receiving the Brass family includes not only Her Majesty Queen Victoria, but her beloved and still very much alive royal consort Albert. Thank you for the splendid reception, Your Majesty. Nothing less than what you deserve, Lord and Lady Brass. Yet again, you have shown yourselves to be the most loyal and capable of our subjects. The continued security and stability of the Empire, from the dusty streets of Bangalore to the frozen reaches of the Canadian provinces, relies on your efforts. Speaking of Bangalore, how fair are our relations with the present Raj? Excellent, Your Highness. The latest iteration of the cult of Kali was routed during our stay with him, and he has agreed to sign on to our Declaration of the Rights of Women in return for a continued support towards the rights of self-government. Seeing as we are willing to listen to Parnell's petition for home rule for the Irish, it would be peevish to neglect the suits of our subjects in far distant shores. Most excellent news, Brass. I'll bet you have some stories from your tangles with the Kali cultists. I'll say we do. Cyril. Your Highness. Excuse my son's enthusiasm, sir. My boy's genius for martial training has kept him safe, but occasionally made him prone to that most grievous of all wounds, an irresistible urge to share war stories. Well, young Cyril, I suffer from a related infirmity, an unending appetite for tales of daring do. We must make an appointment to indulge both of our illnesses over brandy and cigars. Yes, sir. Now that you've completed your mission, will you be staying in London for a while? We hope so, Majesty. As always, we serve at the pleasure of your highnesses. Our pleasure, Lord Brass, is that you indeed remain here in your native city. Our Prime Minister has troubling news to relate to you and a commission we are hoping you will accept. We are, as always, ready to serve. The answer we had wished for. Welcome back, family brass. Now, if you excuse Her Highness and myself, we must retire for the evening. Of course, Your Highness. But is it so late? Not at all. But it is a Wednesday night, and that's our night for early retirement. Mm. There is no amour so sweet as that which comes between a husband and wife after your last child has gone. <laughs> Don't you agree? Oh, Albert, you naughty thing. Making our guests embarrassed. <laughs> we are much amused. Farewell, family brass. <laughs> Farewell, Farewell, your Farewell. Farewell. My goodness. Did you see the neckline on that dress Her Majesty was wearing? Only after careful observation. <laughs> and the way the Prince was giving her the eye. Positively shameless. <laughs> I think it's sweet. Look at the pair of them in their sixties and still as randy for each other as a pair of sixth formers. It is doleful to imagine what she would be like without him. Oh, indeed. Do you remember how she carried on when he was brought low with typhoid back in 61? Do I? The whole of London was a sick ward for four months. Thank heavens he lived. She'd still be wearing widow's weeds if he had passed on. Well, I suppose we should go talk to the Prime Minister. Where is he? He shouldn't be too hard to find. Children, your mother and I have business to discuss. Why can't we... Correction. We have politics to discuss. Uh. Why don't you two go and... Uh, circulate? Yes, yes Mama. Mama. Ugh, I hate these things. At least there's not a sit-down dinner. Last time I was stuck between two dowagers from Manchester who were distressingly enthusiastic about primroses. Instead, we'll be chasing down waiters all night long to make up a decent meal. <sighs> Good lord. What? Look at that... man. Who are you talking about? Oh. Oh my. Cuts quite a... Figure, yes. Don't stare, Gwen! I wasn't! You were! No, I wasn't! But still, 
You'd pick him out of a crowd. Hard not to. He's a head taller than everyone else in this room. And quite a handsome head it is. Yes. A virtual Adonis? Oh, Hercules, perhaps. Look at his frame. Oh, I am. Be discreet, Cyril. I could tell you the same. It'll probably be all right if only one of us looks. Agreed. <laughs> Good Lord. He's headed this way. What? Why? How should I know? Why would a man that gorgeous want to talk to... Hello. Hello. I am... Um... You are beautiful. Gwendolyn Brass. You are beautiful, Gwendolyn Brass. I am Lord Whitestone. And I'm Cyril, her brother. I'm glad you are her brother. Now I take her away. What? To the punch bowl, Brother Cyril. Oh. Oh. Well, I'll just go over here then. Next to these flowers. Next to the wall. Yes. You have quite an interesting accent, Lord Whitestone. I'm a student of accents, you see, and I've never heard one quite like yours. American, yes? No. Ah. Oh. South African? No. Well, I admit it's one that's unfamiliar to me. Ape. I I'm sorry? Great ape. I was raised by a species of great apes, unrecognized by science, who live on a small island in West Africa. Oh, some sort of exchange program? No, my parents died in a shipwreck. I was raised by a grey she-ape, Takta, as her own child. I grew up in the ape tribe. I learned to live, hunt, and survive among the great apes. Among them, I am known as Tuknor, king of the ape people. There is always something new out of Africa, as Pliny says. Who is he? Someone who's been dead an awfully long time and therefore irrelevant. Well, King of the Ape People. So you have two titles, Lord Whitestone? Yes. I came to London six months ago because I could not find what I wanted among my people. Oh? And what was that? A mate. Punch, Gwendolyn Brass. S sorry? Oh! A glass of punch. Don't mind if I do. So, tell me more about the Dark Continent. As Gwendolyn continues her conversation with the extraordinarily handsome Lord Whitestone, her parents have made their way over to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister? Ah, Lord and Lady Brass. You know my chief science advisor? Regrettably, we have not had the pleasure. Though I have, of course, heard of your extraordinary exploits. Professor von Hoffmann, at your service. Good to meet you, sir. I knew your predecessor and considered him a friend. A brilliant man and a tragic end. Indeed. We were shocked and dismayed to hear of Charles's death. As were we all. Have any more details emerged? The tunnels were flooded within seconds. Any evidence as to the cause was no doubt destroyed in the accident. Of course, any excavation on the scale of the Channel Tunnel is bound to have its hazards. We are all just grateful that Professor Mackenzie was one of only three fatalities on that awful day. Well, a sad topic for what was no doubt meant to be a joyful homecoming. Dear Lord and Lady Brass, welcome again to London. I hope that in time I may be so fortunate that you consider me, like my late predecessor, not just a colleague, but a friend. Prime Minister? Lord? Von Hoffmann? Lady? Professor? Until we meet again. One of the most brilliant men I have ever met. Oh, yes. Funny. Can't say I remember meeting him or hearing of him, for that matter. Up to a year or so ago, he'd been toiling in relative obscurity, but then he published a work on the centrifugal dynamics of a planet which caused no end of a stir. That's von Hoffmann. Not at all what I would have expected. What did you expect? A man of genius. Even if his book should turn out to be based on faulty suppositions, it ascended heights of such rare mathematical brilliance that it even lost me. But to look at him, you'd think he was little more than an unassuming schoolteacher. The man has scarcely a shred of ego. He lives only to work, and the focus of his efforts is always to the greatest benefit of our government. 
He's in an hour earlier than anyone else in my cabinet, and he's still there when we turn out the lights. An admirable, if dull, recommendation. Now, Prime Minister, please, what is the nature of the mission that you and Her Majesty would have us undertake? While you have been doing us service in the far reaches of the Empire, problems have arisen here in the capital. What sort of problems? Of a criminal nature. What sort in particular? That's just it. None in particular, all in general. Vice in all its forms now runs rampant. Past what our constabulary can handle. Sadly, yes. Of course we will assist. What's the next step? I have arranged for a meeting with the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police tomorrow afternoon. He will brief you on what we know so far. Very good. Now, Prime Minister, thank you for this reception, but it has been a full day, and we should like to head home. Of course. I'll have a cab brought round for you. Thank you again for taking up the mantle of service. I cannot conceive of what we would do without you. Of course. Goodbye. I think it's about time that he and the rest of the government started conceiving of that precise scenario. Then you are still of that mind, Benjamin. I am. Dear Madeline, for me the joys of adventuring are approaching an end. We have done enough, more than enough, to safeguard the Empire against its enemies. It is time for us to step aside and let others take our place. Speaking of which, where are the children? Here comes Cyril. And there's Gwendolyn talking... Good Lord, who is that giant? I don't know, but all I can say is, well done, Gwendolyn. Cyril, who is your sister talking to? Lord Whitestone, who is apparently very rich and definitely very rude. He practically kidnapped her and has already taken her for three turns round the dance floor. She doesn't seem to be resisting her captor. And here they come. Mummy, Daddy, I'd like you to meet Lord Whitestone. Lord, lady, I meet you with pleasure. Charmed. Why, Stoner, I believe I knew your father, young man. As I recall, you and your mother were lost and presumed dead while on government business. That is so, Lord Brass. They died before I could know them properly. He's an orphan. Oh, really? Pleased to meet your acquaintance. Now, children, it's time to go. Goodbye, Gwendolyn Brass. Goodbye. Perhaps I could see you again? You will. You may come to call on us later this week, if you'd like. All right. And there he goes, carrying my sister's full attention with him. Oh, do shut up, Cyril. He's got a rather odd gait, don't you think? Sort of a lope. It suits him. Ah, well. If Gwendolyn's expression is anything to go on, we'll be seeing more of him. Now, family, a cab, and soon after our familiar rooms await. Perhaps something to eat as well, Father. A chap can only last so long on cream puffs and cucumber sandwiches. I'm sure Mrs. Drake can find something in the larder. Good old Drake. I am so homesick I could practically kiss her stern face. Please refrain. You'd probably bruise your lips. I'm jealous. Oh, Drake. Don't be ridiculous. Yet as the Brass family leave the halls of Westminster, they pass two figures conversing in the shadows, one of whom they would recognize as Mr. Crawford, the businessman they had met on the HMS Byron. Four dead, and the rest bag back coppers. Any of them likely to talk? None of them knows as much anyway. Not good enough, Crawford. You know what the minister expects. Loyalty unto death. Give me the list of their names. What? But these are men I've worked with. The name's Crawford, or I give him yours. Oh, it's not necessary yes, to... Yes, it is. Now go. You'll be contacted via the usual means. What is the import of this covert exchange? And how will it affect our heroes? And when will Gwendolyn receive a visit from the intriguing Lord Whitestone? Join us next week for another chapter in the continuing story of Brass. Brass is manufactured by Battleground Productions. For credits and more information on our show, go to battlegroundproductions.org and find us on Facebook.